<laughs> okay, questions about grignards. Today I think the major topic is epoxides. Bless you. The one reaction that I did not, um, that I forgot to talk about yesterday or Wednesday in class was that if you take a Grignard or you take a, an H- minus from the lithium, aluminum, or sodium borohydrides, if you react those with a carboxylic acid, and it's not just a carboxylic acid, it's a carboxylic acid, it's water, it's a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen, um, any of those, we don't have an attack of the carbonyl. So if I give you a Grignard plus a carboxylic acid, <coughs> the Grignard does not attack the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid. These are both strong nucleophiles. They are also strong bases. And so the critical part there is that when you react it with a carboxylic acid, it's going to do an acid-base reaction. So the Grignard is going to come in, it's going to pro deprotonate. So I'm going to end up basically killing the Grignard and then forming a carboxylate or hydroxide or an amide. And in your then H plus H2O step, that follows that or your then H plus step, all I end up doing is I just end up um, reprotonating the carboxylic acid so I actually didn't accomplish anything. So with one equivalent of, carbo of Grignard plus carbox carboxylic acid, we get basically almost a no reaction. Now that, that'll change in the future if we add two equivalents of Grignard, but we need to it's going to be a while before we get to that reaction. And an equivalent of H- minus would do the same thing. Although, again, more H- minuses will actually cause that reaction um, to go a little bit different, but we need to talk about carbonyl chemistry before we get to that. So that was the one reaction which I forgot, and I did not put that on the quiz. I talked about it in the afternoon class, and then I put something on Piazza, a sheet basically doing this. Okay. Right. What's the HOH and HF? So, any, if a Grignard comes in contact with any um, acidic hydrogen. So, acidic hydrogen, carboxylic acids are pretty acidic. But remember, this is our strongest basis. So, any hydrogen that can be removed that will form a base that is weaker than a C minus, which is all of them because C minus is the most is the strongest base, it'll deprotonate. So when you make a Grignard by reacting the alkyl halide with magnesium metal, if you have water present, this deprotonation step occurs and your Grignard dies. So we used to do this in second semester lab, um, and when you did that, you had to basically flame the glassware to make it dry. Um, if I'm doing it in the lab, I have to do it not under atmosphere, but under purified nitrogen or argon where there's no moisture. Um, and the same thing would happen with an NH. So if any of those are present, the Grignard will deprotonate. It will not attack. At least one equivalent will not. Later on, like I said, there's modifications to this, but right now it just simply deprotonates. So a lot of times people call the, the first one a trick question because it deprotonates and, and you're always used to attacking. You just have to get out of that mode of, okay, it's carboxylic acid, I deprotonate. So don't always just immediately add the Grignard to the carbonyl. Take a step back. If it's a carboxylic acid, it deprotonates. Other than that, the other topics were things like Wurtz coupling, which is just a technical issue, and then deuterium. Um, putting putting a deuterium on, which we can talk about as well, but 
Today's topic was epoxides. So did you have any questions about epoxides? Because I have questions I can give you to see how well we understand that. So the first, here's my first question about epoxides. It is review. The first question is, how do we make the epoxide out of a double bond. What reagent do I need? Sabrina? So the first reagent we can use is peroxy acid. Okay. Unfortunately, you're like, well, yeah, that was on the review sheet. That's why it was on a review sheet. So the easiest and simplest method is to make the epoxide using a peroxy acid, is what this is called. Um, if you learned the MCPBA last semester for meta per, uh, metachloroperbenzoic acid, that is a very specific peroxy acid. It is a benzene ring with the peroxy acid, which is, that would be called perbenzoic acid, which is the PBA part. And then it has a chlorine in the meta position. We'll learn what the meta position is later. So MCPBA is a very specific perbenzoic acid that we use. Um, but we've been just saying per, a perbenzoic acid, just a generic one. So the advantage of using this is it's one step. And just as a review, whatever the stereochemistry is of the groups over here, that stereochemistry ends up preserved in the epoxide because the epoxide is just going to plop an oxygen down on the double bond. So if you have multiple alkyl groups and it's trans, you get a trans epoxide. If it's cis, you get a cis epoxide. And that reaction is stereospecific, not stereoselective. So this, that's a stereospecific reaction where if you change the stereochemistry of the reactant, you change the stereochemistry of the product. So in this reaction, this is stereospecific and that means that trans will give trans over here and if you change the trans to cis it will then be cis. So the difference between specific which last semester if you talked about stereo and regioselectivity one of the issues is that a reaction is selective even if it's 100 to 0. Right? That was our problem was that if you have a Markovnikov product, it is regioselective because it doesn't matter whether it's producing 51, 49, or 100 to 0. The term is it's selective. And there is no term for 100 to 0. I would have chosen specific. But they didn't do that. Instead, they decided to take a whole different meaning of specific. So selectivity meant that we were looking at the products. In specific, it means change the stereochemistry of the reactant, and you will get a different product. So the action is more on the reactant. SN2 reactions are stereospecific, because if I change the chiral alkyl halide from R to S, what happens to the product? It changes as well. Now that's a reaction that goes by inversion, and this is one where basically the stereochemistry is retained. That's not part of the specific. The idea is if I change it, the product changes correspondingly. So these are spe stereospecific reactions, epoxidations. 
Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So that's just a term you'll run into in Top Hat. They, if, if at some point they had a review of all these terms, stereo specific was one of them, that's what it means. Okay. Now, once we make that epoxide, we have to do a reaction with it. So if I make this epoxide with two methyl groups on one side and two H's on the other, and I add H plus um, CH3OH to this, what would be the final product? I'll give you a, I'll give you a minute to write that out or to think about that, but what would be the major product of that reaction? And if you're kind of stuck, think about the mechanism. What would be the first step? Because that's the first question I'm going to ask is what would be the first step in this mechanism? What would be the first step in this mechanism? What should I do first? The OCH3 have to bind to one other carbon. It will, but that's not necessarily the first step. Yes, we're going to add basically the OCH3 to one of those two carbons, and the other carbon will have an OH attached to it. But in terms of the mechanism, what's the first step? Protonate. Protonate the oxygen of the epoxide. So, for those of you that haven't heard this before or forgotten it, whenever we have an oxygen or a nitrogen species that's reacting with acid, the first step in the mechanism is always going to be protonate the oxygen. So, I'm going to protonate that oxygen, and so I'm going to form basically this oxonium ion. And then I say, is that oxygen happy with a positive charge? Or better yet, I say that oxygen, the OH group has a positive charge. Is that reminiscent of any other triangular intermediate that we've talked about that may have a bromine in it. Like a bromonium ion. Nothing. It is. It's like a bromonium ion. Is the oxygen happy with the positive charge? Eh, not really. So what is it going to do? It's going to transfer some of that positive charge down to the carbons. It's going to get rid of most of it if it can. So that's going to leave me with an intermediate that looks like this, basically. Um, 
basically, I'm almost going to have like partial bonds to that carbon. But then these two carbons down here are going to take on delta positive charge. And we'll give the oxygen a little bit, although it's not going to have much. It's just going to offload it to the carbon, to, to the two carbons. If I replace the OH and put a BR in there, it would be that would be a bromonium ion. Bromonium ions were a triangular intermediate. When we add two bromines to a double bond, what do we get? We add two brom BR2, add two BRs. It's not Markovnikov because it's two BRs. There's no Markovnikov addition. And those two BRs add 100% trans. Why? Because it goes through this triangular intermediate. So exactly the same situation here. My, o, my HOCH3, my methanol molecule here, that oxygen is going to attack one of those two carbons, A or carbon B. Which one is it going to attack? A? Is it it has the most substituents, okay. So A, because it has the most substituents, do we agree with that? Do you agree with yourself? Yeah, as I have another question. Yeah. What, um, the, the CH3, so the substituents, help carbon A have more of a, like slightly more of a delta positive? Exactly. So that was going to be the next question. So, yes, the <coughs> nucleophile, when you protonate the epoxide first, so that overall, remember, overall there's a positive one charge here. Whenever those two carbons, they're sharing the positive charge, but they're not sharing it equally. So, yes, the methanol will add to the carbon that is most substituted. Why? Because that most substituted carbon can have more delta positive charge. This carbon, if it was a true carbocation, carbon A, would be what kind of carbocation? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Tertiary. tertiary. So I put tertiary here in quotes, because it's not really a tertiary carbocation, but it looks like it. What kind of carbocation is B, if it was a true carbocation? Primary. It would be primary. And so just looking at it from the standpoint of which one of those carbocations would be more stable, it would be tertiary, but the carbon A on the left has more positive charge. The what the methanol here is a weak nucleophile because it doesn't have a charge. So weak nucleophiles must add in SN1 reactions to carbocations, right? If you don't have a carbocation, your weak nucleophile doesn't react. Primary alkyl halide plus weak nucleophile, no reaction. Why? Because it needs a carbocation. So in this case, that this is on my electron-rich species. It is bound by chemistry law to give its pair of electrons to the neediest carbon up here, which is this one, which is A because it has the greatest delta positive charge. And that's what we talked about last semester. Now, why is it important to interpret this in the triangle? Because in the end, the OH and the OCH3 are going to end up 100% trans. So this will come in, it will add to carbon A, and then this pair of electrons will go to the OH. So that I will have my CH3OH here with a positive charge on it. And then I'll have a CH3 here, a CH3 here, and then over here I will have the OH with the H and the H. And in this case, 
there's nothing spectacular here because there's no chiral centers. But if there was, the OH and the OCH3 must be 100% trans. Right? And I'm probably not telling you anything new because that was one of the final problems on the review sheet was how do you open up the epoxide. If we use H plus H2O, we get two OHs that are trans. But when we use something that's not OH, it will always add to the carbon that is most substituted when you protonate it with acid first. Okay. And then we would lose our H plus here, right? I want to show it's always the weak nucleophile adding and then losing H plus. The whole thing has to add. So I'm not violating my rules about breaking up the nucleophile. But in the end, I end up with my OH group and my OCH3 are 100% trans. Can you repeat what you said about the hydrogen? You said about adding a hydrogen with OHs. So if we did this, so if I, if I would have given you this reaction and said, okay, um, Let's take this molecule and let's add um, H plus H2O. In the end, what I would end up with is I would end up with the two OHs adding 100% trans. Bless you. But in this case, but in this case, because I end up with two OHs, in this molecule, I don't know which I don't know which one came from the epoxide, and I don't know which one came from the water. Of course, I do because it's the same mechanism. The water one is here, but in reality, I unless I label them somehow, I have no idea. But when we use OCH three or we use H, let's say we use H plus Cl minus, the Cl minus is going to add to the carbon that is most substituted. So whenever we do what's sometimes called acid catalyzed, and that's a misnomer, um, in this case it is actually acid catalyzed because that final step regenerates the H+. But if I add HCl, it's not acid catalyzed. But whenever I open an epoxide under acidic conditions, the nucleophile will always add to the carbon that is most substituted. And this is the reason why. It will be 100% trans. Now, that was review, right? Does that make sense? And again, if that's, that was one of the later problems, and I will grade those and give them back to you on Monday. If you have any questions about the review things, you can come in and see me, or you can even post on Piazza, and I can, and I can go over what the answer is. Again, the idea here is it's a review. It was a long review, but hopefully you're like, okay, I remember a lot of stuff I wasn't going to remember if I didn't have to do this. Why did I review acidic epoxide opening? Because now what we're going to do is now we're going to contrast that with opening up the epoxide with a strong nucleophile with no acid. So I'm going to take that same molecule, that same epoxide, and... I'm now going to say, let's react that with um, CH3O minus, no acid. And now the question is, which carbon of the epoxide is the strong nucleophile going to add to? It's still going to add 100% trans. So the OH is still going to end up 100% trans to whatever my nucleophile was. But now sort of the regioselectivity is going to change. When you add acid to the epoxide, you're basically doing an SN. I was worried about the delta positive charges, right? And I wrote carbocation, so that's going to make it mostly SN1. Well, why are you saying SN2? I just feel like I remember seeing that from the video. 
Um, it could be. But the other, the other thing is that this is, a, this is definitely going to be SN2. But the one, I just, the one we just did, this is more of an SN1 mechanism, although it is sort of a backside attack, so it has an SN2 characteristic. Right? It's not a, this is not a true carbocation, because if it was, I'd end up with 50-50 cis and trans. So it does have an SN2 characteristic, but for the most part, the ratio selectivity of how this is adding is adding based on the charge, whether it's a primary, secondary, tertiary carbocation. That's SN1. So this is more SN1. The 100% trans is an SN2 characteristic. And that's how we know. I mean, we could just say, well, let's just add the H plus to the epoxide, break it open, and add the nucleophile. But that's not really how the mechanism works because it has to add 100% trans. So the triangle is still in effect. That's why we have to interpret the mechanism in this triangle. But when I go to this one, I now have a, a strong nucleophile that's just going to attack. And so in this case, this mechanism is going to be SN2. And so which, nu which carbon is the nucleophile going to attack? A or B? It's going to attack B. Why? It's least substituted, least... So this is SN2, so the charge actually doesn't matter. It's, le it's least substituted, it's least sterically hindered. Because what is SN2 reactivity based on? Why is it primary, then secondary, and tertiaries don't react? Because it's based on steric hindrance. So the CH3 minus or any strong nucleophile. What are my other possibilities? My other possibilities are hydroxide, chloride. Well, if these were the cases... I could have talked about this last semester, and actually sometimes I do, but then the book never does. The book waits until now. Why? Because now we have an R minus. Where did the R minus come from? The Grignard. How about an H minus? Where did it come from? Lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride. So now we have these other strong nucleophiles. I'll even throw in from the last chapter, an alkynyl anion. So all of these strong nucleophiles can attack and open up the epoxide. Some people will tell you the chloride can't. We're just going to treat it as if it can. So all of these strong nucleophiles then can attack the least hindered carbon. And so that's the way, the, that's the way it's going to go. And the least hindered carbon. Our choices would be primary over secondary over tertiary. If you have two secondaries, look at the groups that are attached, and the group, if it, one has a bigger group than another, it's going to attack the least hindered. So our first screen is primary, secondary, tertiary. Our second screen is, if they're tied, the size of the groups around it. So. In this case, we started with CH3OH. It's going to come in and attack B, and then I'm going to break the O bond, and so I'm going to end up with then the O minus over here on that carbon, and then 100% trans of the CH3OH adding there. This is just like the Grignard. First of all, if I added acid, I would change the mechanism. If I added acid, the first thing I'd do is protonate all these nucleophiles, and then they're not strong anymore. So these are always done with a then H plus H2O step. So the OCH3 adds 100% to where the OH is. In my second step, I'm then adding H plus the O minus adds the H plus. And 
now I've added my nucleophile to the least hindered carbon and the OH ends up on the carbon that is most substituted. So this is exactly the opposite of using acid. And so in this particular case, I started with the same epoxide. Under acidic conditions, I added the OCH3 to A. And under strong nucleophile conditions, I added the, the OCH3 to B. Again, it, organic is somewhat about the yin and the yang, right? The uh, Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov, or I'm going to form the most stable double bond, or I'm going to form the double bond that is least stable, the uh, Saitsev versus the Hoffman product. Or in free radical halogenation, I'm going to add the bromine to the carbon or substitute for the hydrogen that is tertiary. Or if I use statistics in high temperature, the bromine will go on the hydrogen that is um, on a primary carbon where there's more hydrogen. So I couldn't do much in organic if, in synthesis, if I couldn't choose which way I want to go. And so with epoxides, I can do that. Acidic conditions, nucleophile adds to most substituted. This is called basic conditions because there's no acid. And with the exception of chloride, these are all bases. So I'd call it strong nucleophile addition. So when you add a strong nucleophile to the epoxide, you get exactly the opposite. The nucleophile adds to the carbon that is least hindered. So I can switch. Want to add HCl? If you add HCl, you'd add the Cl to the most substituted. If you add Cl minus first, then H plus, you get exactly the opposite. So does that kind of make sense in terms of epoxides? A lot of what was in the reading today, hopefully, was review. Or if not, it's coming back. This is new, but basically all I'm doing now is doing an SN2, not an SN1. So here would be So if I took that double bond of that cyclohexane ring and I made an epoxide, what would I get if I added H plus CH3OH? What product would I get? What product would I get if I added CH3O minus and then H plus? So take a minute to think about that. And if there's a complication that arises, yell. You can discuss with your neighbor, that's perfectly fine.
Do we run into a complication here? No? Really? Which one of the two is easiest to do? How about this one? Okay, so if this is A and this is B, where's the CH3O minus going to add? Is it going to add to A or B? B? Now, they're both what? They're both secondary? So it's adding to B because... Because B has a methyl group and A has a an isopropyl group. So less sterically hindered. So the CH3 minus is definitely going to add to B. So that, that's going to be my major product, right? I'm going to end up with the OH. If I put it on a bold, dash, a bold wedge, that means on the dashed wedge will be my OCH3. And my methyl group will be on the bold wedge. So you have to so it doesn't matter whether you have one on the bold, one on the dash. The critical part is for them to be trans, they've got to be on opposite wedges. But for the for the nucleophile adding directly, it's going to add to B because the methyl group is less hindered. Now, they're both secondary ties, so that's when we go to what group is smallest. And if they were the same group, well, the same group it wouldn't matter. If they were comparable, then you would get a mixture of products. So then the question is for the next one. My first step in the mechanism is to go ahead and protonate the oxygen, right? And then where is my CH3 OH going to add? Is it going to add to carbon A or is it going to add to carbon B? A? Do we all agree it's just A? Anybody want to go for B? No? So when we protonate, it's basically an SN1 mechanism. What is an SN1 mechanism based on? It's going to be based on the delta positive charge on each one of those carbons. Here's, here's the thing. And I, I've been doing this a long time. 
every day just gets longer. <laughs> so when we had carbocations, all we cared about was substitution pattern, right? There's one thing that never entered into our vocabulary with an SN1 reaction, and that was sterics. So each one of these two carbons is, when it becomes the delta positive carbocation-ish carbon, they're both secondary. The nucleophile only cares about charges in SN1. It does not care about sterics. So it only cares about the positive charge. They have equal positive charge, so what's the nucleophile going to do? It's going to add to both. 50-50. So that isopropyl group doesn't affect the delta positive. Exactly. The, the isopropyl group isn't going to affect because this is driven by charge, which makes it SN1, not SN2. So in an SN1 reaction, the nucleophile must add to the carbon with the greatest positive charge. It doesn't care about sterics. So in this case, you get a 50-50 mixture of the products. Okay. What I will do is I will um, I'll add in the mechanism on the next slide. I always post these in the folder, whatever I write out. So I will do that if you want to go back. and You can try it, and then you can check yourself. I will release some problems of the epoxides that I have, and you can go ahead and try them. They are um, going to have a mech, they're going to have um, an answer key. Monday's quiz I'll email out, but as you can imagine, it's going to be what reagent do I use to go from a double bond to an epoxide, and then once you have that epoxide, I'm going to ask different reagents, acidic and strong nucleophile, and you're going to write the product. So that will be the that will be the topic for Monday's quiz. And I will take your if you want to leave your um, if you want to leave your uh, scantrons over on the table by where Joe is, then I will pick them up there.